Hi and welcome everyone. Um, so this is our final session in our spring webinar series um, and we're really grateful to be able to invite uh, Dan Knight uh, from Consular Services at the US Embassy in London to come and talk to us about how to apply for a student visa uh, in the US and answer some of those common questions um, about that visa process. Um, before we get started, um, I'm going to say a little bit about the Fulbright Commission um, and Education USA services here. Uh, my name's Rowena, I'm one of the Education USA advisors for the Uni United Kingdom. Um, and so we help um, students uh, uh, figure out how to study in the US and how to go about that process. Um, I got to study uh, in California, um, uh, but as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm actually from the UK. Um, it was the best thing I ever did was being able to go and study in the US um, and so we're super excited to be able to help you go and do this process too. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of this webinar um, and I just um, ask that you hold on to your questions until the end because some of your questions may well get answered by Dan's content and Dan's talk. Um, but once um, we get to the end you'll be using the question and answer panel um, in your uh, webinar tools um, to be able to ask questions and we will take those questions and try and answer as many of them um, as possible. Um, we'll also be sending out this webinar um, as a video afterwards to both people who attended but anyone who was unable to attend as well. Um, so please just know that you'll have this as a resource. So just to let you know who, who Fulbright is uh, and what Fulbright is, um, just to introduce ourselves, um, we are a, uh, we we're a non-profit based here in London um, serving uh, the UK um, and our job is to um, help people figure out how to study in the US. Um, so Fulbright um, was a very famous US senator um, and after the Second World War um, had this uh, audacious plan uh, to use uh, money uh, to set up a scholarship scheme um, for people from the United States to go and study around the world and from people from other countries in the world to go and study in the US. 70 years on, um, that's been happening uh, all the way through those years uh, here in the UK um, and those scholarships are for graduate level students, what we would call postgrads here. But alongside that, we also are the Education USA Advising Centre um, here in the UK um, and so our, our role here is to help anybody in the UK who wants to study at, in the US uh, to figure out how to go about that. Um, so our services are offered for free um, and it's things like this webinar and our other webinars about US study um, and our events that we do in person and also things like College Day which we do each September uh, which is an opportunity to meet US universities. Uh, all of these things are part of our work here. So. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to hand over to Dan. Um, so uh, Dan is the Vice Consul um, from the Consular Section at the US Embassy in London. Um, he's been a Foreign Service Officer with the Department of, St of State uh, since 2012 and has previously served in Chennai, India and Washington DC. Dan comes from Columbus, Ohio and has plenty of UK connections as his wife is from Edinburgh. So Dan, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna hand over to you, thank you. Thanks, Rowena. So I have to say this is definitely a great technological leap forward for me. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, so I usually stand in front of rooms and give this presentation. So this is a great chance for me to do this uh, in this format, but um, as, I, as Rowena mentioned, I'm a consular officer at the US Embassy. Um, I'm in the visa section. So I am one of the people that uh, you all, if you are, and I assume most of the people on this webinar are uh, students who want to study in the US. When it comes time for you to study, uh, you would come and talk to either me or one of my colleagues at the embassy uh, about a student visa. And the student visa itself is really the last step in a long process for you guys in terms of picking a school, finding a right fit. What we're gonna talk about today uh, is really the end of that process, which is the student visa process itself. Um, I have done a lot of student visa interviews. Uh, as Rowena mentioned, I've been a foreign service officer for about seven years. Um, I would say there's a lot of stress, I think, uh, involved in going into the embassy for a visa uh, I've definitely seen a lot of that firsthand and really, you know, my point of being here today is to give you all information and, and to assure you that it's really a pretty painless process and it's not something you need to 
really stress out about. Uh, this PowerPoint is going to just walk you through all the steps that that you need to take in advance of coming in and talking to us. Uh, and we'll leave plenty of time uh, at the end for questions. Uh, and I hope you you all have a bunch of them. I'm happy to answer as many as I can. So we're going to get started. And as I said, a dinosaur, you'll see this PowerPoint has some pretty groovy transitions. Um, they get pretty funky. Uh, I'll have to say I didn't put together the transitions. I think whoever did just wanted to have fun with me. Um, so maybe you guys can vote on what your favorite transition was at the end. But um, as this first slide here mentions, we're talking five steps uh, on how to apply for a visa to go study in the US. And we really try to make it as simple as possible. So here they are. Five easy steps. You're going to, we're going to walk, I'll walk you through what all this stuff means. But basically step one is you're going to get a form I-20 or DS-2019. That's your first acronym today. It probably won't be the last. We in the government like those. Uh, but I'll explain to you what that is. Step two is you have to pay the first of your second fee, first of two fees, sorry, to come in uh, for the interview. That's called a SEVIS fee. I'll walk through what that is. Step three is you complete a form DS-160. I told you acronyms, here's another one. It's basically the visa application form. That's a fancy way of putting it. Step four is you book your interview online to come in and talk to us. And step five is you actually come to the interview. So we're gonna walk through each of these steps um, in greater detail so you know what they are. But as I said, five easy steps, it should be a pretty straightforward process. So we'll get right to it. Um, step one, you need a form I-20 or form 2019. Well, what's the difference between those, you might ask? Well, if you're going for an F-1 or an M-1 visa, which are two types of visas that the U.S. give, you're going to be issued this form by the program that's sponsoring you in the U.S. So if you're an F or an M, you're going to get an I-20. If you're a J, you're going to get a DS-2019. Why do we have two forms? I have no good answer for that, but we do. And in terms of how you slot into an F, an M, or a J, that's going to be determined by the program that you use in, uh, in the States. They're going to make that choice for you. So you are not going to have to um, pick, do I want an F or do I, or do I want a, an I-20 or a 2019? It's going to come to you likely in the post from the, the program in the States or from your office here in the UK that is organizing that. So you're not gonna have to worry about, do I have an I-20, do I have a 2019? You're going to get one of those forms and you need to bring the actual form that you're gonna get to your interview when you come in. It's gonna have a few signatures on it from the program coordinators. That is, you can't bring in a photocopy, you have to bring the actual original form. So that is step one. Step two is you have to pay what's called a SEVIS fee. SEVIS is Student and Exchange Visitor Information System. So for any of those of you who are uh, waiting on bated breath of what that means, that is what SEVIS means. SEVIS is part of Homeland Security. So the first fee you have to pay is you pay online via the link to SEVIS, which you will get with the, the document you get. You'll know exactly where to go and you'll pay that fee. And listed on this slide are the prices for Fs and Js. Why the price for Fs is different from Js, I don't know. I work for the Department of State. Homeland Security is a different part of the US government. They set the prices, so that's the fee you would have to pay. So again, that's not a fee you're gonna bring in person to pay to us at the embassy. In fact, you won't be probably doing any payment the day you come in. Um, but that fee goes directly to Homeland Security and the, the document you get will walk you through how you pay it. But you do have to pay it before you come in and see us. If you forget and you come in and you don't pay it, it happens all the time, it's not the end of the world, but it'll make the process for you a little bit longer and a little bit more complicated. It's easier for you if you pay it in advance. So step two is pay your service fee. Step three is you're gonna complete what I said is this DS-160, that's a fancy number and, and letter combo for just paying your, your, putting together your actual visa application. It's gonna be um, on the website where you go to apply for the visas. Um, most of you are probably tuning in 
uh, from England, Wales, or Scotland, if you're doing that, you're likely going to come down to London for your interview. If you are tuning in from Northern Ireland, we have a consulate in Belfast, and you can go um, do your student visa interview in Belfast. It's really your choice. You could, even if you were from London, you could choose to go to Belfast. I hear it's nice. Maybe you want a little bit of a break, but probably you're going to go to London. Um, and you were going to fill out your application online. Um, there's a few notes here on the slide saying um, you'll need to pick the correct visa category. This uh, online system is kind of like, I guess as a wizard is how I would call it. It will advance, it's like choose your own adventure for us old folks. It will advance you to the next slide based on what you choose. So you're gonna need to start with F if you're going on an F visa and you're gonna know you're getting the F visa because it's on the I-20. It's all pretty intuitive. So that's where you start when you go on to the website. Is you would choose F or you would choose J. Um, one thing to take note of it uh, on the middle of the slide, it says, have you attended any secondary educational institutions? What you need to do is you need to list all schools, colleges, universities you have attended since the age of 11. I know that sounds kind of silly, but that's what you have to do. Go all the way back to the age of 11 when you fill out that information and just, and just fill it in. Um, I think that addresses everything here. It's a pretty intuitive system once you get to the website. It's something where I think you have to create, I'm pretty sure you have to create a login to go in. If you don't finish it all in one go, you should be able to, but if you don't, you can save your work, save your password, and go back in and, and complete it at a second sitting if you need to. Um, because I said I'm a dinosaur from another age, you have to use an actual desktop or laptop computer to do this. You can't fill out your visa application on a phone or a tablet. Um, and it has to be connected to a printer, which is kind of amazing in the year 2019, I guess, but that's the way we work. So you will actually have to fill this out online and print it and bring the DS-160 confirmation page to your interview. So that's going to have a barcode. You're going to be able to stick a photograph on that. Um, that's kind of your, your ticket in the door when you come to your visa interview is the DS-160 page and you're gonna to have to actually print it. So that's why you need to have connection to a printer. You're gonna print that, and you're also going to print the SEVIS fee receipt um, page that you get to at the end of that SEVIS fee. So just so we're, we're summarizing where we're at right now, you're gonna be paying two fees before you come in. You're gonna pay your application fee for the DS-160, and you're gonna pay your SEVIS fee, and you're, you're gonna be bringing three pieces of paper with you, to your interview at a bare minimum, which is your I-20 or 2019, your SEVIS receipt, and the DS-160 page. So I'll get to a little bit more about paper here in a second, because it's an important point. But just so you're keeping, keeping track, those are the documents you're going to have to bring. So step four is you book your visa interview. And um, when you make the appointment, you can choose how you would like to receive your visa. You can either get it at a regional pickup center, which is actually, it, we give you the choice of having it delivered to your house. I think it's referred to as an expedite, but a pro tip here is that it isn't actually an expedite. It gets you directly to your house, but it'd be faster for it to be returned to a pickup location. So if you're not in the countryside, you're near a place where there's a pickup location, you can choose that location, and usually it's probably your best bet for getting your visa back. We average about three to five business days for how long it takes to process a visa. Once we've completed an interview, we've approved your visa, we need to do checks and get it printed. It takes about three to five days to get back to you. So just to keep in mind of that. And so, as I mentioned earlier, just getting back to this, so here is the visa itself. We're talking about visa interview itself. That uh, little graphic in the screen there is the waiting room uh, in the embassy. It's a brand new embassy. It's a really nice space, nice place to come for a visa interview. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is what you would bring. You would bring the I-20 or the 2019. You don't bring a photocopy, you bring the original one. You bring your SEVIS fee receipt that you're gonna be able to print online. You're gonna bring the DS-160 confirmation page, which I already told you what that is. That's the one that you'll be able to print once you've done your actual application. You're also gonna bring your passport, because obviously the visa goes into the passport, so you gotta bring the passport. 
Um, and if you have any old, any UK or US visas, really any, any visas um, from, from the past, regardless of whether they're expired or not, if you have a US visa and an old passport, you should bring the old passport because we might need to see it. And you'll also need to bring a photograph. Um, and there is a website called travel.state.gov. That's the Department of State's official consular affairs website. Again, that's travel.state.gov. If you have any questions about what the appropriate um, requirements are for a passport photograph, that's the place you can go. There are actually quite a few of them. Um, you can't wear glasses anymore in a photograph for um, a passport picture. That's one of them that's been a recent change. So um, I've seen all varieties of creative selfies. Uh, some of them work when you bring it in as a passport photograph and some of them don't. Um, if things don't work out with the photograph, uh, no harm, no foul, it's nothing personal. We have a passport um, photo booth at our embassy and we will gladly charge you some money so you can uh, print, get new photos. So again, not the end of the world, um, but bringing the, the photo in at the first instance and having it be right will, will save you some hassle. Um, here is an important point of what not to bring. Now, I know a lot of you are coming from outside of London, so maybe you're coming on a train or an airplane and you have a bag. Um, there are a few places around the embassy, um, businesses that have picked up on the fact that we don't let folks bring large bags in and they will gladly charge you some money uh, to leave your bag with them. Uh, I'm not endorsing any of those places, but again, if you have a big bag, you can store it, but really the best thing to do is just not bring it because we do not let you guys bring in any large bags, any laptops, um, other prohibited items, typical stuff like airport screening, you can't bring that stuff in. Um, you can bring your phone in, um, which uh, Embassy London does, which a lot of embassies don't do, which was kind of amazing when I first learned that, but you can bring your phone in, so you won't be completely bored as you're waiting for your interview. Um, but nothing, nothing big or bulky. Um, it says expect to be at the embassy at least two to three hours. We're kind of over, uh, shooting that, you probably will be there for less, but it could be that you're there for a little while. Um, we are in the busy season right now, so if you have an upcoming appointment or if you're thinking about getting your appointment, should have said this at the outset, but one of the if you walk away from this with not a lot else, please book your appointment as soon as possible. Get in, see us, because as we get later into the summer months, everyone's going to be like, oh man, I have to do my my um, visa appointment, and then it's gonna be really busy. So the earlier you can book your appointment, the better everything's gonna be. Um, let's see. Uh, not to bring, yeah, you really shouldn't bring anyone but yourself. Uh, flight bookings, that's mentioned because um, while we hope everyone who comes in and sees us gets a visa, not everyone does, and sometimes it takes a while for the processing to take place, so you should not be making flight arrangements and booking things and paying for things in advance of having that visa in your passport. So do not make any flight bookings in advance of the appointment. Um, let's see. Ooh, that is a fancy line. That might be, that might be my favorite. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into a few details here about the actual interview, but let me just say at the outset here, what a visa interview is, what, I, what we do is we efficiently ask the least number of questions we need to ask to determine, um, to determine that you qualify for your visa. So for US, US visa law is written kind of funny, and the way it's written is that you are uh, presumed to be an intending immigrant until you provide evidence to us that you aren't. That sounds kind of harsh and weird, Basically what I'm saying is you have to prove to us that you're going to the US for a temporary period of time and you're coming back at the end of it. Easy way to do that is you hand us your I-20 and you say, hey, I'm going to University X for a term for study abroad. That, that is the biggest part of the interview is answering that question, great. We would then ask you some questions um, about how you will pay for, this, for the studies. That's another key data point that we're gonna talk about during the interview. And assuming there are not a lot of uh, additional questions asked from that, it's gonna be 
in and out in a few minutes for the actual interview. It's going to be kind of a whirlwind for you on Visa Day. Um, but we don't ask more questions than we need to, and you're going to find out why when you come into a lobby and you're going to have um, 150 of your closest new friends packed in to be uh, in, waiting for their interview. We are busy, and so we move you guys in and out as fast as we can. We're trying to be courteous, so we're not going to rush you through and shout at you and shout all these questions and get you out of there um, in a rude way, but we are going to be efficient. And so um, just so you know, you know, we're looking, the easiest thing you can do is bring the documents that I've mentioned um, and be ready to just answer the questions that the visa officer will ask you. It's real easy. Sometimes people come up and just launch into uh, a speech and that's great and I know you're excited. The easiest thing you can do is just let us ask the questions, you provide the answers and we'll have you in and out real quick. Um, so, okay. So, I would like to say that every single person that comes in and talks to me is issued a visa. And we want to get you guys to the United States to study. So, I can tell you at the outset, every visa that we can approve, we do approve. However, there is going to be cases where we need to refuse a visa. And we don't like refusing visas. I take no pleasure in it. But my job is to um, facilitate legitimate trade. Uh, and travel to the United States, and so sometimes the answer is no. Um, the first bullet up there is what I have talked about earlier, which is the whole you are an immigrant until you prove otherwise. Um, what we are assessing, what you'll hear words thrown around online if you guys really want to freak yourself out and go onto forums and see what do the visa officers ask you and things like that. We're looking for what we call ties to your home country doesn't have to be the United Kingdom. I know there are probably folks on this webinar who might not be uh, UK nationals, but are here at the, at the uh, moment studying, or you live here temporarily. What we're going to do is assess what's going to bring you back to the country where you're living. And for a lot of you, that's going to be the UK. We do that by asking a few questions. What we don't need to do is see a huge binder full of documents um, that shows all your different ties. We don't need copies of your library card and your gym membership and this, that, and the other. It's not a document heavy process. We're probably not gonna ask for anything more than the documents I already talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, so just so you know, it's a conversation. It's not a document review. Um, again, I'm getting into kind of nuts and bolts of uh, US government talk there is something called a 214B refusal. That means we've determined that you um, are not um, qualified for the visa. We don't want to do that, but that's sometimes what we do. There's also a code called 221G. It's basically meaning we're putting your case on hold because we have some more work to do, some more questions to answer. Um, that's about all I'm going to say about, I think there's another slide that goes into a little bit, uh, one topic a little bit more in advance. but. That's really all you need to worry about. I really wouldn't stress about it. There is something, uh, one of the 221G reasons is called administrative processing. You might come to the officer and the officer says, your case is pending administrative processing. Just means we have more work to do on your case. That will not probably be satisfactory to a lot of you. You will say, well, what is administrative processing? I will give you a tip. What we will say is it is administrative processing. And if you say, geez, can't you tell me a little bit more? What I'll say is, I'm sorry, it's administrative processing. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on that. I think you guys get the point. It's administrative processing. I hate even saying it all these times. But just so you know, we, can, we will not be saying more than the case has administrative processing. It just means we have to do more work on your case. We will give you a piece of paper that explains that in a little more detail. Um, and we will be back in touch with you by email, most likely, once the processing that we're working on is complete. Um, when those situations arise, it is almost always the case that you will not have to come back to London for an interview. You would be able to go home, and we would then follow up with you um, by email or by phone. So that's one thing that's nice, is that almost certainly you will only be coming to the embassy one time. Um, so before we open it up to your questions, I'm going to kind of uh, jump the jump it a bit and get to what I have seen, what we have seen is frequently asked questions before. Um, look at that key. Thing must be like 20 years old. Anyway, um, what if I make a mistake on my application form? 
I'm glad I asked myself. Um, what you would need to do is, is, as I mentioned earlier, is when you fill out your visa application form, um, you will do it online. And if you realize later on, oh, geez, I made a mistake, you can log back into the, um, the system where you completed it and you can edit it to make changes. Um, I'm just going to read this to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, worst comes to worst, if you have to start from scratch, you can start from scratch. You're not going to have to pay a new fee. But the best thing you can do is just remember your login when you complete your visa application form. And that way you can just go in and edit it. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, let's see. Right. And the bottom says if the, if the number changes after you book your interview, it's no big deal. Just tell us when you come in for that day. So it's, it's, bottom line is it's really not a big deal if you make a mistake. You can so we can even have you make those changes on the day of the interview. Um, can third country nationals apply in the UK? Well, I already kind of hinted at that. Yes, the answer is yes, of course. Um, if you are here in the United Kingdom, you can apply in the United Kingdom. It doesn't matter where you are from in the world. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that first point of what we're going to be figuring out in your interview is we're determining your, your ties to another country. And if you're studying here in the UK, then we're probably going to use the UK as that country where we're going to um, draw ties to. Um, so uh, yes, you can apply from anywhere in the world. It, it doesn't matter for us. Uh, it says consular officers cannot evaluate ties to a third country. So what that means is my job really is to assess your ties to the UK. If you are from India and you are here on a tourist visit, probably not the best idea to come into London for the interview because I don't know a lot about India right now and I can't really assess your ties to India when I'm in the UK. But if you're here studying and you're here for a while and you're going to be, you know, that makes more sense for you to come in. If you're just passing through, probably makes more sense for you to go back to the country where you're coming from and apply there. We're pretty much across the globe in terms of where we are, so we can see you um, in your home country. Do I need to show proof of funds? This is one of those um, popular questions I get a lot of. Yes, by law, you have to prove to us that you are able to afford the degree you're going for. Um, <clears throat> I think the actual statute says you need to for sure show us evidence for one year and then um, a plan for the rest. Now, does that mean you need to bring in a gigantic wheelbarrow full of documents with things like deeds to houses and um, itemized uh, jewelry collections and whatever, um, you know, all that other stuff? No. Uh, again, it's an interview. So assuming what you say um, makes sense to us, we're not going to ask even to see documents. So if you say, geez, I'm, I'm paying because um, mom and dad are helping and mom and dad, we might say, well, what do mom and dad do? And you'll say, well, dad's an architect and mom um, is a receptionist or something. Or mom's an architect or mom's a lawyer or whatever. It doesn't much matter. Um, that's probably going to be it. We're probably not going to say we need to see mom and dad's bank statement. Um, again, it's not a document-based process, really. It's a conversation. So bring only as much paper as you feel like you need to um, to back up those statements. So if you're paying with savings, yeah, it probably makes sense to print out a bank statement. If you're paying with a gift from a relative, maybe a letter saying that, that they sign it, saying that that's what's happening, that kind of thing. Not a lot of paper. Um, and it says there is no set form that evidence of us. It, we can't really tell you exactly what you need to bring in, but really less is more. If you bring, I, I will tell you one thing that will drive a consular officer crazy. If you slam down this big old binder of stuff and start shoving paper under our fancy uh, uh, windows, because we're going to be talking through you through this goofy glass, that's, that's probably not the best way to start the conversation. So again, don't have to bring a lot of paper with you. Um, okay, what is optional practical training or OPT? Um, uh, probably a lot of you have heard of this. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it, but what it is, is it's something that your program might be able to offer you. Uh, it all depends on what program you're going on. Usually it's someone who is going for a full course of study. You can then continue after that and um, sometimes do uh, what's called OPT, which is sometimes, it's, 
It's basically an internship. Um, but the folks who determine whether you're eligible for OPT and what kind of OPT there is, um, STEM, for example, um, has an extension that's for science, technology, uh, engineering, maybe in math. I don't remember. Um, but again, the, the person you'll want to ask about is OPT an option for me? Is your designated school official the, the person in the student office that's helping you? Um, get over to the United States, it's not going to be the consular officers. We're not going to know anything about OPT. Um, if you want to take note of that address at the bottom of the screen, that um, takes you to the Department of Homeland Security's website where they talk a little bit more about OPT. So I'll give you all a second to write that down uh, if you need. OK, another good question. How soon can I travel? Um, it is up to 30 days before the date of that's listed on your I-20 or your 2019. So that piece of paper you're going to get is going to have the date when your program starts. And you can go up to 30 days before the date on that, uh, on that form. So you can't go way in advance. It has to be 30 days or less before the program starts is when you go in to the US. Doesn't mean you have to wait to 30 days to come in for your visa interview. As I already said, you really need to book your appointment with us as soon as possible. Um, and how long can I stay in the United States? This might be the most popular question. Um, there are limits. So for F1s, you can stay for up to 60 days after your course finishes. And for J1s, it's 30. Um, and as it says here, the grace period is to travel within the US and to leave. I get a lot of people who say, well, what happens if I just go up to Canada for uh, a while and then pop back down to the US? I should say at the outset here that the folks who make decisions on how long you go into the US for, it's not me, it's Customs and Border Protection, which are folks at the airports who you've probably encountered before, colleagues of mine, nice people, they get a bit gruff sometimes, they're the ones with guns on their hips, they're the ones who make decisions on how long you come in for, and so if you do the old out to Canada for the weekend trick, they've seen that a million times, and that's something that's not gonna make them happy. Much like shoving a bunch of documents under my window doesn't make us happy. Going in and out like that, I can't guarantee you what's gonna happen there, but it might not be that you're able to just pop back in and out. So pay attention to those deadlines. Um, I also get, and I'm sure there'll be questions about this, if you get done with your program and you wanna stay longer, a lot of folks ask, well, can I just switch to ESTA? Um, you will have to go out of the country you will have to come back in. And again, popping out and coming right back in on a visa waiver, what ESTA is, um, is the visa waiver program. A number of countries can do that where you don't even need a visa to come in as a visitor. Um, that's something you're not gonna wanna do is just to go right back out and right back in. It's one of those, another one of those common things that Customs and Border Protection are like laser focused on avoiding that happening. So. Uh, I'll have, be happy to answer questions about that later, but that's a, a start for that. I assume there'll be some follow-ups on that. Um, those are the big question blocks that I wanted to highlight. I hope you guys have a bunch of questions for me. Um, happy to answer as many as I can. Uh, and I thank you all for your time, and I, I thank uh, Fulbright for having me over. This has been fun. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, so just for anyone who's tuned in since we started, um, I'm Rowena from Fulbright, um, and I'll be uh, moderating the question and answer. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, in your um, webinar controls, you can see the Q&A area. We've already had a few questions come in. Um, please do add your questions there, um, and we will be able to answer those. Uh, so I'll be putting Dan in the, the hotspot, um, and uh, getting him to answer your questions. Um, so we'll jump straight away. We've had some really great questions so far, um, and we'll try and get through as many of these as possible. So um, the first question that we've had that I just wanted to highlight um, was somebody, Eleanor is asking, um, can interviews happen on the weekend? Uh, I don't work during the week. Um, no, <laughs> so we are open uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, and uh, one thing to check when you book your appointment is to make sure you're not coming in on a holiday. Um, one of the cool things about being a diplomat like I am is I get both US and UK holidays off, which is great. Um, so the US has their own holidays sometimes. Um, so be sure that you're not 
trying to come in on a holiday, but we are open um, Monday through Friday, and your visa appointment will almost certainly be in the morning. Um, most of our interviews are done between the hours of 8 and uh, eight and 1230. Those will probably be the slots you'll be able to choose. But unfortunately, we're not open on the weekend. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I have another question here from Claire, who's asking, is it only UK nationals who can apply for their visa at the embassy in London? So, um, no. So as I mentioned earlier, and I'll just reiterate that, um, no, you don't have to be a UK national only to apply for a visa in London. Um, we will see anyone from anywhere in the world, but just so you know, as I mentioned earlier, what we're looking for is assessing your ties to this country, to the United Kingdom. So if you book an appointment with us, be expecting that the first question we're going to ask you is, I see you are from country X, why are you here in the UK? And you'll just need to be prepared to answer that question. So for a lot of you, it's going to be real simple. It's, oh, I'm at uni here, uh, and I'm going to be studying abroad, you know, leaving for my program. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so other questions we've had um, is, um, uh, Beth is asking, what happens if I've not been given a DS um, 2019 or an I-20? Um, well, if you haven't been given one, you'll need to get in touch with the program that's sponsoring your study abroad in the States, because they are the ones who uh, issue that document. The Department of State, um, we are not the ones who actually issue those documents. It, it is our document, but it's issued by the organizations that are sponsoring you for your study abroad. So um, you couldn't, if you ask the embassy, where's my 2019 or I-20, we're really, we don't have an answer for it. You're going to have to go to the program official that, that you've been working with and they'll be able to get it to you. Again, you have to have the actual paper copy when you come in. So they will be sending you that document in the post, almost certainly. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here about cost. Um, so we're going to take these two together. Um, so uh, someone's asked, what is the cost of the DS-160? Uh, and um, someone else has asked, how much does a visa cost on average? And I know you covered these, but perhaps you yeah. can just recap that. Um, so, you know, I actually think, and, and you'll have to check on the website because I'm not 100% sure I'm blanking a bit, but I really actually think it's $160. Maybe that's why it's the DS-160. Probably not, but I really I think my, my best guess right now is the visa fee is $160, and then you'll have to pay the SEVIS fee as well, which I think was $200 for a J and $180 for an F. I can't remember. It's back in the slides. Um, I can... I can I can answer that if that's okay. Good. Good. Uh, the the F visa is uh, the service fee is two hundred, uh, and the J yep. is eighty. So if okay. you're applying for an F visa, F one visa, then it will be three hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rowena. Yeah, so it's two fees. It's the service fee, and then it's the the application fee itself. And it's been a bit of a long day, so my brain's a little. Uh, it, I'm drawing a blank a bit, but I think it's one hundred and sixty dollars. But the website will be able to will be able to guide you in terms of that. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we have lots of other questions. Um, we have questions. Sorry about this. Um, so uh, William's asking, can the embassy post the visa once it's accepted to outside of the UK? So, for example, to France. No. So, uh, if you um, no. So we would be able to ship it to a location in the United Kingdom. That's a good question. Um, we get some folks who, um, yeah, might live in another country or are traveling. Um, you're going to have to give yourself three to five business days, and you're going to have to get it sent to you here in the UK. If you want it sent to another country, France, for example, you would have to apply. Brilliant. And on a similar um, note, um, we've got someone who says, I live in the UK, but I'm going to Toronto for the summer. Will it be possible to do an interview there or do I have to come back to the UK? Um, you can do it in either location. Um, I would say that each post 
uh, has its own policies. So if you're gonna apply in Toronto, it could be that they only um, interview folks who are living permanently in Canada. I can say for the UK, we take ev everybody. Um, so you would wanna check on the US Embassy or the US um, Consulate in Toronto's website. Um, but you could either, it's, it's probably pretty likely you'd be able to apply in Canada. However, as I mentioned earlier, if you did choose to do that in Canada, the first question from the officer in Canada is going to be is why are you applying here? You are a UK national. So you'd have to say, well, I'm here for summer program or something. Like that. But either one's fine. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've got another question um, from Emma, who has a question about um, entering the US this summer earlier than 30 days um, before her uh, J-1 visa starts, um, entering on an ESTA, um, and whether um, she can then uh, leave the US and then re-enter on her student, student visa. Yep. So, I knew this was going to happen. This is... Um, so uh, what I will tell you is that the easiest thing you can do is make your travel to the United States as uncomplicated as possible. What, if where you are studying in the US, you need to enter on the student visa. So you can't go in early on your ESTA and then just stay there and then go right to school. You would have to come in through the airport for the purposes of studying. Now, if you wanna go as a tourist earlier, and go on ESTA, you can do that. I would be upfront and honest with the Customs and Border folks that you are going in as a tourist and then gonna come back as, as the student later in the summer, but you cannot come in as an ESTA visitor and then just stay and stay straight through and show up to school. You have to come in um, on the actual visa. If you did that, what you're gonna do is you're skipping a step and it could be at any point in the future when you go through border, border controls, they'll wonder how you came in. And if you didn't come in the right way like that uh, on the actual student visa, that might create some problems for you. So really important um, to, when you're going into the United States, you're going in for the purpose, we call it purpose of travel. That's what the border officials are gonna look for. Um, so, those dates that I mentioned earlier in the presentation are really important um, to pay attention to those dates when you go in. I, I really don't want anyone to um, unintentionally make a mistake because what will happen in a lot of cases is Customs and Border is gonna turn you around and send you back to where you came from and make you pay for it. Uh, and that is a long day. And I've seen people at the other end of that and it's not pretty. So um, really try, I'm really giving you a, um, uh, a strong recommendation here to, to pay attention to those dates um, that I mentioned earlier. Great, thanks Dan. Um, so we've got a couple of questions, uh, just sort of find them again. There's some great questions coming in. Um, so someone's asking, can you work on a J-1 visa? And there's a second question that I've just got to find. Um, somebody else asks, I've been told that we can get a job on campus on a J-1 visa. Is that something you'll ask during the interview, or do we not, and do we need to mention it up front if it's something we're considering? So, another good question. Um, and the answer, this is the classic Department of State answer. Um, one of my favorites is, it depends. So, uh, some, the J visa you will find is, and I'm not gonna get too dorky on like, uh, on visa talk here, but, it is a very versatile visa and a lot of different categories fall into it. So a J visa, um, folks who go as summer camp counselors go on J visas. A J visa is a cultural exchange visa. So um, camp counselors, their reason for going is to work. They're gonna work at summer camp. Summer work and travel, also a J. The reason you're going is to work. Um, but for students, um, your, your 2019 as, as a J is going to say what category, subcategory of J you are, and it's probably going to be study abroad, and it is likely that you will not be able to work. Um, but if you are able to work, it will almost certainly say it on the 2019, and it's a question you would want to ask your program officer um, when you're choosing your program on whether you are allowed to work. There is no blanket, yes, you can work 
on a J visa or yes, you can work on an F. It really depends um, on, on the specifics of the program. And for Fs, it's probably almost certainly no, because you're going in as a student, um, you're not expected to be going in and working in the state. So best piece of, of guidance there is pay attention to what the form says and what your program is offering you. Um, but it's not a question, to put it one way, if you come in as an F student and you don't have anything saying you're gonna work, and you mentioned to the consular officer, oh, I'm planning on working as well. That's what I would say is a start to a not great interview. So um, pay attention to what the actual form says. It will set the guidelines for what you can and can't do in the US on that. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, another question here, uh, just to double check, we can't do anything before we uh, receive our form to fill out in the mail, right? Uh, can't in terms of booking your appointment, I think is where that question's coming from. And the answer is, yeah, you should, you should wait till you have your 2019 or I, or I-20 with you before you go online and do those steps one through five are in order. So wait until you get that form first. If you were to book an appointment and you didn't get your form, it's going to be a really short interview. <laughs> we're going to say, where's the form? And you'll say, I don't know. I haven't had it yet. I'll say, okay, come back and see us when you have. So yes, you need the form before you make the appointment. But once you have form in hand, you should book your appointment as soon as you can. Great, and so we've got several other people asking similar things. So anyone who's asking about a waiting for an I-20 form, can you know, you need to wait for that before you can book uh, your interview, right? Yep, and feel free to um, politely bug your program sponsors in the US and or uh, for you know the program sponsor for that, you can follow up with them and ask them. They should be telling you when you can expect the document, um, but they're the ones you'll need to follow up with and, and check in. Um, to get the form. And you can book an interview fairly quickly after after you receive that form. Correct? Absolutely. Once you have form in hand and you've paid the fees, you can book your appointment. And as I said, um, you know the earlier you do it, the better. We're in busy season. So our waiting time was down to about a week before, and now it's up to 23 days. Um, we are really busy. So um, getting your appointment booked as soon as you can is going to be going to be the best thing you can do. Great. A um, couple of other quick questions for you, Dan. Um, Gillian's asking, should we dress formally for the interview? Um, up to you. We have no dress code. Um, I will be wearing a tie because I have to. Um, but no, you can wear whatever you want to wear to the interview. Um, I find some applicants, you know, come in checked out. That's fine. Others come in in like, you know, board shorts and flip flops and it's really up to you, whatever you want to do. You're presenting yourself to a U.S. government official. So dress accordingly and respectfully. Um, and Nick is just asking when you're using the term program sponsor, do you mean the university that will be hosting us while we're abroad? Yes. Great. Um, so other questions, loads of great questions flying in. Um, so I'm just keeping up with these. Um, Ellie's asking, do you need to know the address of where you'll be staying in the US when you're applying for your visa or at the interview? No, but it could be, I, I really doubt, that's not a common question that we ask. Um, so a lot of folks don't have that figured out. I mean, so no, no. you don't need 100% to say I'm staying here. Um, we might ask you what your housing arrangements are. Probably we're not going to, but you never know. Um, Abigail asks, can I leave the States and return whilst on my student visa, e.g. to go home for Christmas break or to travel to Canada to visit friends for a weekend? Yes. Yep. While you are a student and during when you get your visa, it's going to give you the dates um, of how long that visa is valid for. And the Customs and Border Protection folks will admit you for the period of it's called duration of status is the kind of goofy industry term for it. Um, so, yes, you as while you're a student, yes, you are not you're not being held in the US for your studies. You can go in and out on that visa. Um, every time you go back through the airport, you're just going to show them the student. So yes, 
you can travel internationally while you're on your student visit. Great. Um, so uh, how long does it usually take to receive our visa once approved? Three to five business days. Um, and then Daniel's asking, if a parent is accompanying you when you first go to the US, do they enter on an ESTA as well? They can. Um, that is one option, sure. Um, ESTA, you would need to go to the um, Customs and Border Protection website for ESTA because not everyone gets to travel on ESTA. It's a program for a number of countries. Um, so, so long as your parents are ESTA eligible, they can accompany you to get you settled in on an ESTA. They don't need a visa to do that, so long as they're eligible. Um, we have another question. I'm also entering the, the US on an ESTA in June and then coming back to London, after which I'm coming back to the US to study in September. Does this make a difference? No. Again, if you go in as a tourist in June on an ESTA, that's great. You'll leave the country, come back to London, and then fly back with your visa in hand and show it to the Customs and Border folks and go in as a student. No problem. Okay. Um, so we've got a question. Do we need to show receipt of the service fee only at the interview or a receipt of the application fee too? So the uh, form with the barcode, the DS-160, is your proof that you have paid for the visa form. So that's the one document you need, and then you'll print out the service fees. So it'll be two pieces of paper there showing that you've paid two fees. Okay. Um, and somebody else is asking, where do I pay the service fee? You pay it on the service website, which will be, um, your program sponsors should be giving you that. Um, if you, it should be on your 2019 and I-20, if it isn't, you can just Google Sevis and it'll bring up the portal there and you can pay it there. It's a service of the Home of Department of Homeland Security. Okay. okay, great. Another quick question. Um, uh, I live on the Isle of Man. Can I go, can I choose whether to go for an interview at either Belfast or London? Yes. And I, um, I've not been to the Isle of Man. I think the flag's pretty cool. Um, I imagine it's a great place. Well, I don't know which one's closer. Uh, maybe someone can answer that for me, but yeah, choose either one you want, it's fine. Perfect. Um, so uh, if I get a visa for my college in New York, can I travel to other states as well? Yes, although you'll find the regional differences in America that some states think they're their own countries. <laughs> uh, I won't name which ones. Um, but yes, you can travel within all the 50 states. That includes Hawaii. Uh, uh, yeah, you can do that. Great. Um, Sarah is asking, I'm trying to get through these nice and quickly. Yeah. Um, so Sarah asks, um, also, do students have to apply for a new visa for each year of study, or is the visa issued for a full four years? So the, again, going back to the, the magical I-20 or 2019, it will show you the duration for that period. And that is what you will apply the visa for. So for multiple year students, usually that um, year, the years on that form are, are the duration of your stay. So you're not gonna have to hop in and out every year, um, but it really varies. There is no blanket answer for that. It's just whatever is on the form. Um, how much influence do we get over the scheduling of visa interviews? Do we get to pick a time or are we assigned a time slot? You do get to pick a time and you do get to pick a date. Um, so yeah, you get to pick the time and date, um, but uh, appointments fill up. So you, it's really, you know, first come first serve, you pick your time and date, but yes, we don't assign you a time and date. Great. Um, do we find out the result of the interview on the day? Yes, it's, uh, it's a, a lightning round type of thing. You will find out your results uh, quickly. Um, again, the average visa interview is three minutes or less. So you will find out that day. Um, why are there restrictions on bringing passport covers and folders to the interview? That's a good question. Um, I, think what they're, I think the reason for that is we need to handle your actual passport and if it has a bunch of stuff, I think what passport covers means is if it's covered in plastic or if something's on it, it, 
it makes it difficult for us to handle. So we're just saying that to keep it nice and easy so that you don't have to take time disassembling your passport book um, or having us do it, which would be less um, good, I think, as an option. So we're just saying, just bring your passport. You can bring it to the building in a cover, that's fine. Just when you go in for the interview, just take it out and hand us the passport. Great. Um, you've kind of touched on this, but some more information would be really helpful. If after my study abroad, I want to stay, in, stay for the summer and holiday, um, how do I go about doing that? Do I have to go all the way back to the UK? Is there no other option? Right. So in terms of after your period of study is ended, that clock starts for the time period where you can stay there as a student, you would then have to leave the country and you would have to come back in. Now, as I said before, it's presumed that when you apply for the student visa, you are going in as a student and you're returning to your home country. So you could try, but I wouldn't recommend it. And it's not for me to recommend, but if you go out of the US and you're from the UK and you pop over to Canada to kind of reset your clock, I can't guarantee that that's gonna work for you. Again, when you go in as a student, you're expected to return to where you came from um, at the end of that. So it might mean you have to come back to the UK and then head back over. And so I would hope, I, you know, I know 30 and 60 days isn't a huge amount of time, but that is a pretty good grace period there for you to get some trips in. It's expected after your study program that you will head back to, to the country where you're coming from. So it's not, our, our student visa isn't set up so that you have a lengthy period of time at the end to experience America after the, the study. Great. Um, other questions. I'm an international student studying in the UK. Is it favorable for, to apply for a visa in my home country rather than the UK? It's entirely your choice. Um, again, we're assessing your ties to the UK, but if you're here as a student, that's a pretty strong connection to the UK. Um, and so I don't think it would be a problem. It's really a matter of convenience for you. If you would prefer to apply in your home country and you're gonna be back there, you can do that or you can apply here. It's not, there really isn't, so long as you're here um, you know, for a decent period of time, the one thing I think might be a little challenging is if you are in a third country and you just come to London for a holiday and you decide to book, um, we're gonna ask you what your ties are to the UK and if you're just here for a week, um, you know, it might be better for you to, to wait till you're back in your home country. But either one works. Great. Um, find the next question. Do you have to be a certain age to apply for a visa? Um, I believe what it is, is if you are under the age of 18, I think, um, you need your parent or guardian to come in with you. I know I see a lot of young folks who are going, because you get student visas to do things like high school, um, but um, that's something you would want to check on our website. It'll spell that out in detail. Um, but I do believe if you're below a certain age, you'll need parental consent to come in. And I think it's under the age of 18, but please don't quote me on that. Go to the website that's highlighted on this slide. It'll give you the, the answer um, better than I'm giving. Perfect. Um, so, um, how much finance do I have to prove or does the university I'm attending in the US set this amount? Uh, so, your form that you'll have, either the 2019 or the I-20, will have listed itemized the cost of the program you're going for. And so you will have to show how you will afford that. And it, it breaks it down. So if you're going on an athletic scholarship, that would be a, a line item saying the scholarship. If you get financial aid, that'll be listed there. Um, it, it, the form itself lays out how the, the course is being, is being um, afforded. And then it's really, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's up to you um, to prove to us that you have that, that plan in place. And again, it's not providing us with you know, tons of paper, it's just having a conversation and, and that plan making sense to us. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and just a couple more questions, if you're still okay to be answering them. So we still have loads yeah. of questions coming in. I know, I see it. Um, 
so uh, Jasmine says, I know you've said not to book flights before you have your visa, but is that just a precaution in case it gets rejected or a rule? Only checking because we're planning to enter the States around 10 days before the official leaving in day, which would fall within the 30 day pre-entry period. A concern right now is the cost the longer we wait to book. It's a good point. Um, this is where I will say I cannot I cannot order you to not book your flights. What I will say is it is really not a good idea to do it because it is on you if that, if for whatever reason your visa isn't ready in time, um, it, we do not have an ability to refund your fare. So it is your choice. And if you book a flight before you come in for your visa, you are taking the risk that you're gonna get that visa in time. And if you don't, you're out of pocket. Great, thanks Dan. Um, my passport expires a month after I'm planning on leaving the US. Is that okay? Um, should be, um, but I'm pretty sure for most countries you can apply for a renewal. Um, I know in the US this is the case um, at any point. So if you wanna get a new, a renewed passport with more validity, you can choose to do that. Um, when we put the visa in your passport, we're assuming, we're checking to make sure that the passport is valid on the day we're doing the interview. If you, if we put that visa in an old passport, all it means is you're going to have to carry around two passports, which a lot of people do. Um, but you could certainly make the choice to apply for more validity and get a new passport. It's up to you. Um, where do we place our small bags during the interview, such as a handbag or any other items? Uh, you'll have it with you. And uh, it's gonna, you're gonna come in and you'll be moved through the, syst uh, the process and so it really will be with you. There's no shelves or anything to set it on. You'll come in, talk to us and carry the bag with you the whole time. That's another reason to not bring a lot of stuff because whatever you have, you're gonna have on your person. For the, for the day. Right. Um, how is the visa put into part our passports? Do we leave them at the embassy? Yep, so you leave the passports with us we hold on to them, we put the visa in them, and then we route them to you via uh, a delivery service. I know, um, that's, I know it's terrifying, but we actually, you know, we will not lose your passport. We will put a visa, it'll actually be new and improved with a US visa. Um, what happens when we reach the airport in the States? Who do we see and where do we go? <laughs> uh, you will go, uh, in terms of immigration purposes, when you arrive in the States, you will be uh, interviewed by a member of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, and they handle all screening into the United States. And so you will go into the airport and they will take your passport and they will check the visa that we've given you and they're the ones who admit you to the United States. So those are the folks who make the decisions on uh, how long you can actually go into the United States. The visa itself is kind of a weird concept, but the visa is basically your ticket to admission to the United States, but the folks who tear the ticket and stamp it, I'm using a movie reference, I guess, um, or a venue event, those are Customs and Border Protection. They're the ones who actually let you come into the United States. So they're the ones who are gonna make that decision. Great. Um, do I have to carry my visa everywhere I go in the States? No. Nope, um, always a good idea to have, I mean, this is just what I do, always a good idea if you're in a foreign country to probably have some proof of ID, but no, you're not gonna have to walk around with your visa with you at all times. No one's gonna be walking up and, and doing visa checks on you. Thanks. Um, if I'm going to be moving to the US in mid-August and have my documents already, when should I pay my service fee and book my interview? As soon as possible. Great. Um, so I have a B1, B2 visa valid for 10 years. Can I use both my B1, B2 visa and my J1 visa? When my J1 visa is over, can I stay in the US as a tourist? You can't stay in. You'd have to go out and come back in using the B1, B2 visa and at the Customs and Border Protection would check that you have the visa and would probably ask why you're coming right back in on a visa after you've left on another. Um, I'm thinking about booking a flight to London for the interview. Will my passport be kept for the visa? It will. That's a good point. Um, so 
we need to be able to put um, the visa in the passport if you are flying down and you absolutely need that passport to get back and you have no other form of ID, what you can do is go back home after the interview and you can send the passport back to us by courier. We'll give you the instructions on how to do that. Um, it takes a little bit longer, so it's an option, um, but it's a lot easier for you if you just you know, let go of the passport for a few days we get it turned around quickly. But I can understand for some of you, that might be your only form of photo ID. In that case, we have other options. Great. Um, I'm flying to the US uh, in June on an ESTA. Do I need to tell them then that I'll be entering later on a student visa? No, nope. You can just, you know, if you're going in for vacation for a temporary period of time, you don't have to, I mean, it's really up to you. It's not gonna put you at a disadvantage if you mention, you shouldn't hide it from them and say, oh, you know, I'm not going to tell you about my studies. It's nothing really to be ashamed or hide it. Um, but it's really up to you. Again, the, the customs, the three minute consular interview is going to be luxuriously long compared to your interview at Customs and Border Protection and all that. Um, so there is no, no, you shouldn't, or yes, you should. I, I, I really, I'm just giving you my, my opinions on it. There's really no guidance. Great. I've got two questions from different people that I'm going to add together. Um, so what happens if you don't have old passports containing old visas? Um, and the other question was, do I need to worry about visas for other countries that I've been to, not the US? No, not really. Um, that, that point is really made for we want to just make sure that old US visas um, are uh, if they're expired, we just want to look at them. So, so no, if you don't have it, it's okay. We're, gonna, you know, it's not going to stop you from getting a visa. You just would need to explain where it was. Um, and no, we're, you know, we can flip through your passport, look at your travel history. It's not something we do often. Um, so, you don't need to, you know, have every single visa to every single country you visited brought in. On the actual application form, we give um, there's space to put the countries you have visited. Uh, previously and so we can see your travel history that way. Um, if you have an ESTA already does that make any difference um, or am, am I absolutely okay to continue with the visa application as all other students? Yep you're okay to do it no problem. Great. Um, what if my passport expires while I'm in the US and I can't renew my passport before the visa interview? Um, then you would probably have to visit a consulate or embassy uh, of your country in the United States to get a new passport. You would then have to take both pass, you know, you'd use the passport with the visa, it wouldn't get rid of that, you would use that, but you would need to get a passport from your government um, and just have them together. Great. Um, just have a look and see if there are any other questions that haven't already been covered. Um, we will be sending out this recording to everybody who registered for um, this webinar. Um, so um, you can review back the slides if you missed any of them. Um, we, let me just check that there is no other questions that we haven't covered. Some of the more general questions um, I'm gonna leave. Um, if you would like to watch um, our videos about studying in the US, um, or webinars about how to go about with the process of applying and studying in the US, and we'll cover those there. Um, oh, we have one question here. If I have more than one passport or older passports, should I bring these to interview? Um, if they have US visas in them, sure. If not, you, you really don't have to worry about it. You don't have to bring all your passports. Um, it's okay, don't need to bring everything. Um, and so am I allowed to bring a book to read while I wait for my yes. appointment? <laughs> yes, and thank you for saying that, a book made of paper. Old men like me enjoy the, <laughs> that, that way of doing things. Yes, bring a book, bring a magazine, bring uh, headphones. Um, you're okay doing that. Just know that we are moving you in and out of our building as fast as possible, so you'll need to pay attention um, I have seen folks get wrapped up in whatever they're watching uh, on Netflix or even folks who decide to take a nap in our visa lobby. Um, so, you know, make sure you're not too distracted, but yes, bring something to pass the time. You can make a friend when you uh, show up to the interview because you're going to be in our lobby with tons of other people. So you can do that too.
Great stuff. So I think most of the questions, we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, most of the questions that are, are left, um, many of them have already been asked. So we will be sending out this uh, via email, a recording of this webinar, and you can check in. Um, but please do uh, feel free to get in touch with the US Embassy here in London if you have any um, other questions. Um, and just thank you so much, Dan, for uh, giving up your time this evening to join us. Um, I found your webinar really helpful and I hope everybody else has too. Um, and so uh, thank you so much. Uh, for yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks for tuning in and thanks to the Fulbright Commission for sponsoring. This was a lot of fun and I hope it was useful for everybody. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we will uh, sign out now, um, but thank you so much. Bye.